the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, episode 780 for Monday, September 16th, 2019. And welcome back to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab. Or if it's your first time listening, welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab. And if it is your first time listening, you should know that this is the show where people send in you. In fact, send in your questions, your tips, your cool stuff found, all of the things that come up. Either to help others or to get help for yourself. And then we mix it all together, formulate it into a bit of an agenda. And once a week or sometimes twice a week, we get together and talk through it and help solve all the problems that we can with the goal being that every single person, us included, leaves every week having learned at least five new things. Sponsors for this episode include mintmobile.com slash MGG and linode.com slash MGG. We will talk about those in more detail momentarily here but for now here in durham new hampshire i'm dave hamilton and here in fearful connecticut this is john f brown how are you today mr john f brown i got my duncan here duncan oh that's a that that is that is a i'm not a coffee drinker so i i but i i think duncan is mostly a a you know East of the Mississippi kind of thing, right? Or pretty much. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I got some at the store. Got it. Well, that's, yeah, that's generally where it goes now. Yeah. All right. So you, you're, uh, I didn't even, I guess, of course you have a Duncan near you. Everyone here in new England has a Duncan near them. <laughs> <laughs> of course, that's how it goes. I wouldn't know. Cause even though I've been to your house many times, I don't look for Duncan donuts. I would like to point out. Monica shared something with us that might be helpful when we're in a conversation like this about Dunkin Donuts and you want to skip to the next thing. Monica says, I was just catching up on episode listening to episode 773 and noticed that you have actual usable chapter marks jackpot. I know how much effort that takes, but boy, does it make it easy to jump around the episode. She says, I've been using Downcast for years. I also uh, am an Overcast user, but I keep coming back to Downcast. Sometimes I just want a specific meaty bit I skimmed in the notes. Again, amazing details. And that's true. Show notes at geekab.com. Otherwise, I'd be listening to podcasts in my sleep. I'm so oversubscribed. Again, many thanks for the hard work. You put into the podcast. Well, thanks, Monica. Thanks for saying that. Thanks for reminding us about the chapters. It's interesting. I was actually asking in the post show after the last show for the folks in the chat room at MacGeekGab.com slash stream if, uh, you know, if the chapters were useful for you folks as listeners. We're not going to stop doing them. Even if you say, no, we never use them. We're not going to stop. It, it's, it, we have actually created a workflow where the chapters are not terribly difficult to do. And it does help us kind of keep track of things as well. So so we will continue doing them. But I am super glad to hear that they are usable for you in uh, in your podcatcher of choice. In fact, Apple's podcasts app uh, also supports chapters. So you should be able to get them everywhere, which is good, which is good. Yeah. And hey, they're helpful for uh, post-production if you don't want to. Go through the entire podcast to look for that one little thing. Yeah. It's like, where did I hear that? Mm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. No, it's good. Yeah. Works for me. Yeah. And I did mention the show notes on the website. Uh, we put all the links, including chapter markers in the show notes on the website. And you so you can click through and find, you know, what you're looking for. If you are interested in ensuring you don't miss anything. Go to our website, MacGeekUp.com, and subscribe so that you can uh, to the email that's there. And that way you will get uh, the show notes delivered to your email box every uh, pretty much the day after they are published or sometimes the day that they are published, depending on how the timing works. So, yeah, good stuff. Sweet. All right, John, you want to take us to Lee? We've been talking about clipboard managers and and you've got uh, notes from two listeners that uh each have another yeah. one to share some good follow-ups there's a yeah there's a ton of them out there 
None of which I tried yet, but I should. So um, anyways, Lee says, hello. There's been a bit of discussion about clipboard managers as of late, so I thought you should know about this gem in the app store. Copy M paste. Uh, it's $14.99, and uh, Lee thinks it's worth it. Uh, it lets you configure as many clipboard lists as you need. Switch between them, copy, paste via clicking or keyboard. It accepts text, images, final cut clips, audio, search for clippings, everything. It also syncs across Mac iCloud accounts, but not iOS. Huh. Oh, well. Uh, it also lets you sort each list independently as shown, so I think it meets most use cases. The preferences are extensive and include appending, prepending, extra text, transforming existing text, upper lowercase capitalization, screen chap, yeah, screen capture, deduping, etc. I use it for managing lists of metadata all day, every day. The developer is responsive and updates come regularly. I've used other clipboard managers, but this is my unquestioned favorite. I don't even look for others anymore, although I suppose that means I might be getting caught, but I doubt it. Cool. Thanks, Lee. That's great. Yep. So, yeah. And um, and then you had another one from Fabian, too, right? OK. You, OK. You put the uh, the link there. Okay. Yeah. Link yeah he, didn't, he didn't include the uh, he didn't include a URL, but uh, we did. And uh and then Fabian, whoa, uh-oh, my list changed here. Yeah, you just deleted something and scared me. <laughs> I, de I deleted Lee's note. We got to archive that stuff, man. We're moving forward. Yeah, but uh, but it makes everything else move, and then I lose focus. Um, so anyways, Fabian says, greetings from Singapore. Well, the, well, greetings from United States. Singapore, never been there. It's nice. Um, in 777, a listener, Matt, was looking for a clipboard manager that works as a stack. And listener Felipe recommended Clip Revolver. Another great alternative is Copy Clip 2 from FIPLAP. Oh, never heard of them. Okay. Oh, no, FIPLAB. I'm sorry. Okay. That was a typo there. But uh, okay. Yeah. Well, thanks for the uh, suggestions. And. Uh, Maybe I will try them out. <clears throat> I, th I think, it, it, like, like I've said many times, it's one of those things that if you're not using one, you don't necessarily see the use for one. And then once you have one and, and have found a way to integrate it into your workflow, it it becomes indispensable, which, you know, which is kind of how these things work. We also talked about places to sell your used uh Apple devices, Macs, iPhones, and in the wake of Gazelle, I mean, they still exist, but it doesn't seem like any of us has had a good experience with them recently. Certainly nothing that compares to what they used to be like. And uh, and so we've got a couple of those. Listener Steve wrote in with uh, reminding us of sellyourmac.com, which, yeah, of course. I can't believe I missed that one. We just interviewed Brian Burke, the founder and CEO of of that over on our small business show. So yeah, uh, sell your Mac.com. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm sure we've seen them at a, at a past show. I'm sure. Oh, you, you know, he's been around for forever. Yeah. 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 It's just, uh, we just weren't thinking about it. So I'm glad this is why we do this. Uh, this is why we do this show because the, we all learn things, even things that we learned and forgot. So there you go. Yep. Mm -hmm. And here's another one from listener Dave. And uh, he kept it short and sweet um, for the Geek Challenge in episode 778. Kleiman, K-L-Y-M-E-N, may not look fancy, though I've used it three times with 100% success, quality service and higher returns than Gazelle. So I wonder if that's the name of the guy that runs it or something. Oh, yeah, it might be. Yeah, I've never heard of climbing before, but um, but, you know, there you go. So listener Dave has and he likes him. So there you go. Is this good? Is this good? Uh, you want to we've got one last tip that's kind of a follow up from uh, from all this. I, I will uh, actually it's separate. It's a separate follow up. So while we're on the subject, I and we'll talk about phones and all that stuff, but I uh, I wound up using Apple's trade-in if they uh, 
because we have some old iPhones around. We have an extra iPhone 7 and an extra iPhone 6S Plus that uh, we need to, uh, that we don't do anything with, and, and they are not our spare iPhone. So I put them on our uh, Apple trade in list because we're actually ordering two iPhones, or we did order two iPhones. We've got two coming on Friday. We've got a iPhone 11 and an iPhone 11 Pro showing up. So I figured I'd, tr- I'd use that to try out Apple's trade-in. And it, the values that we got for them were higher than what anyone else would offer us for these phones. It, we'll see if the actual value paid once we send them in matches. And if so, we'll, I'll, I'll, well, either way, I'll report back. So there you go. Did you order an iPhone yet, John? No. Oh, Mr. Braun. So why not? Um, actually, I'm looking. Uh, I, I've done a trade in with Verizon for the yeah. last several phones, and uh, I'm not quite at the point where I can trade it in without a. You got to be like halfway, or at yeah. least halfway into your uh, contract, and I'm not quite there. A couple of more months. Got it. Got it. So you just you're going to wait until that point, and then and then do it. Uh, I mean, you know, like we, we, you know, when we talked earlier about it, I'm, I mean, I don't really see anything really compelling and I still don't like losing touch ID, but I mean, the camera looks, looks uh, spiffy. Sure. You know, the camera always gets better, but, um, yeah. you know, other than that, uh, you know, nothing really struck me as a, you know, a must have Sure. versus what I have now. You know what I'm saying? I I, I've seen a lot of people say they're going to skip they're going to skip this one because, you know, they, they don't see a, a big difference. Yep. Yep. I, yeah, I do. I mean, for, from the standpoint of what we do here, it, I, at least one of I, I, I would think that both of us would want to have, you know, the current model phone to be in, able to answer all these questions. But um, but yeah, I do get that. There's not. um, You know, I'm well, I'm actually quite happy with my iPhone 10 R. Uh, the one thing that I've sort of missed with the 10 R cause I went from the, I got the 10 and then instead of getting the 10 S I got the 10 R. And so going from having, uh, two cameras, uh, you know, on the, uh, two back facing cameras down to just one on the 10 R meant that there were certain types of pictures I couldn't take. And, you know, it definitely was a downgrade from the camera standpoint, uh, I'm glad to see that they've reintroduced that into the essentially the, the you know the 10 R's replacement or successor I should say which is the iPhone 11. So uh that is interesting to me. And you know it, stepping down from the OLED screen in the 10 honestly that didn't really bother me. I noticed it but it it was simply something I was aware of not something that I missed if that's a you know a good way of saying it. So yeah, I think I think we're going to I think Lisa's going to take the 11 and I'm going to take the 11 Pro, but I'm not entirely sure that I might actually want the 11 because um, I like I like my 10R. So we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Yeah. yeah. Well, she does a bit more photography than you. Yeah, you a say? lot more. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. So. Uh, so, yeah, I think she could uh, give uh, give that thing a workout. Yeah. Yeah. So but ours will be uh, ours will be here on on Friday. So we'll. We'll have all kinds of conversations about that. One Am more- I going to have to get a new case? Is it? Every is it, is time. It- oh, yeah. Well, no, the 7 to the 8, I was able to, the, the 7 and the 8 were the same size, so I didn't have to get a new case. The 10s are together. all different form factors, so yeah. Yeah, great. Well, that even going from like a 10R to an 11, same form factor with one exception, the camera. And so I don't think 10R cases would fit on the 11 and and... 10s cases definitely won't fit on the 11 pro with that you know three camera away array that's back there so yeah yeah you just need a new case so it's fun though it's a time to get a new case like you you honestly from what we've seen here around the house i wouldn't recommend keeping the same case on your phone for more than a year um because they do tend even the you know like the spec cases which i really like and find to be super protective i mean you know i think i've told stories about how my daughter dropped her phone from the top of a roller coaster and it like bounced down through the you know the guts of it and landed on the ground and in her spec case was literally you know unharmed but those cases take a beating and over time that beating can 
compromise their structural integrity, especially around the edges, right? Where you kind of need it to be a little soft. Uh, oh, I had, I had that happen. Yeah. And, uh, so I have for my eight, I have, uh, I like the, the clear case because you can still see the, you know, the little apple on the phone and stuff. But, um, yeah, one of them, one of the, uh, uh, joints, if you will, or, or, you know, little pieces, uh, just broke. And, you know, I went to, when I was at the next show, I'm like, yeah, it broke. And they're like, yeah, it happens. You know, I mean, the plastic degrades over time. Any plastic does, or most right. plastics do. Yeah, so, yeah, um, yeah. and I think they warranty it for life. So, you know, if your case falls apart, um, make sure you go with somebody that <laughs> stands behind their work. Well, and just replace it. Like it, it's, <clears throat> I, I think it's realistic to expect to replace your case at least once a year, mm-hmm. maybe, maybe more frequently than that. So, uh, you know, that, that part doesn't bother me about getting a new phone. It's like, yeah, okay. If I'm, if I'm mm-hmm. the type of person that keeps a case on a phone, I will want it replaced. Uh, yeah. And I am that type of person. I know there are many people that are not, and that's also fine. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, all right. One last tip. And then, and then there's something about these new iPhones that are arriving on Friday that I want to talk about. Uh, that's going to impact a lot of us. So, but take us to this last tip here, John, before we go. Okay. Just has a good one here. This may be too niche, but for those people who don't want to pay for Zapier, Zapier. I use this great Zapier. Yeah. I use a, what is a Zapier? Well, it's a tool. Um, <laughs> yeah. I use this great workaround for Wufu and Google Sheets. It's basically a web book and a pre made script. I use it every year for kids after school uh, club signups. Oh, nice. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. So, uh, so she's got a link uh, for us or something. Yeah. So we got, yeah. So it's an article. So we'll, uh, we'll link to that. Cool. That's awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I I love this stuff. Yeah. Cool. Um, all right. I want to take, um, we, I do want to talk about this thing that's going to affect if you're a Dropbox user and you're getting a new iPhone, there's a conversation we need to have, and we're going to have it. Uh, first, I want to talk about our first sponsor, which is Mint Mobile, because this is freaking amazing. I, you know, it's it's rare that something comes along that truly kind of changes the way I think about, you know, it's something I've been using for a long time. But Mint Mobile has done that with wireless service, Right. Because the big wireless providers here, especially now in 2019, have expensive retail stores, inflated prices, hidden fees. And many of us are being taken advantage of because these providers know that we'll pay. And this is the opportunity that Mint Mobile has seized upon because they provide the same premium network coverage they're used to. They actually use T-Mobile's network, but all the policies and billing and everything is Mint Mobile's. And they are able to do that at a fraction of the cost because what they do is bring everything online. They save on retail locations and overhead, and they pass those savings directly on to you. And by doing so, they allow you to cut your wireless bill down to just 15 bucks a month. That's crazy, right? Crazy. Every plan comes with unlimited nationwide talk and text. And with Mint Mobile, you stop paying for unlimited data that you don't use. You choose between a plan of 3, 8, or 12 gigs of 4G LTE data. You can use your own phone with Mint Mobile. They also happen to sell phones if you want to look into that with them, too. So awesome. And the coverage and speeds are way better than what I was getting. I mean, it's crazy. So to get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, and get the plan shipped to your door for free and get their seven day money back guarantee. Go to mintmobile.com slash M G G that's mintmobile.com slash M G G cut your wireless bill down to 15 bucks a month. One more time at mintmobile.com slash M G G do like we've done. Check it out. All right. So John JP, let's, let's, let's have some, uh, JP. Oh man. Well, yeah, actually I'm going to, I'm going to start with Paul here because Paul, oh, okay. Paul's is the one that, that gets us, uh, kind of into this conversation here. Paul says, I'm currently trying to get an answer from Dropbox to an issue that has arisen in relation to their 
relatively new three device limit imposed on basic aka free account holders i've had a basic account with dropbox virtually since its inception i have only modest needs for the service and quite happily accept the three device limit my mac ipad and iphone are all linked to my dropbox basic account i use carbon copy cloner to clone the internal boot drive on my imac pro the other day i test booted my mac from the clone drive the boot process proceeded smoothly then at one point dropbox asked me to log in on completing the login, however, Dropbox informed me that I had exceeded my three device limit. In order to access my Dropbox account while booted from the clone drive, I had to unlink one of my three existing linked devices, one of which was the Mac I was currently using. It seems Dropbox deems a single Mac to be two unique devices when booted from two separate but identical or cloned drives. Can you shed any light on this? Uh, yeah, Paul. And it's a good question. The way I've experienced, I have over the years, this is this particular way of treating things is not new for Dropbox. It's just that their three device limitation now makes it matter because over the years, anytime I've logged into Dropbox from a new boot drive on my Mac, it sees it as a new drive to sync to. And I, honestly, I think that's smart. You know, Dropbox is syncing your data back and forth. If it notices anything different about the destination of that data, I think it's good to ask you and say, whoa, OK, hey, something has changed here. I just don't want to blindly start syncing data because it doesn't know that it's the same drive. In fact, it very much knows that it is not the same drive and it can't know that it's just a clone. Right. So. I think it's really smart that Dropbox uses probably the unique drive identifier. Is it a UDID or a UUID, John, on the disk? I can't remember, but some I, some unique identifier of the disk, whatever whatever the right term term is for it here. That's what it uses so that it knows if things have changed. Uh, yes, you're right. So so there are two UUIDs. So but um but I think I see where you're going with this. So there's a volume UUID which is applied to a drive, but your machine also. You know, and you can find this in the uh, system info. There's a hardware UUID. So there's a unique identifier for both the machine and the drive. And it sounds like they're not entirely. The device should be the machine, not the drive. But it sounds like they're considering the drive. Yeah, a different I, machine. I, actually, I actually disagree. I think the device should very much be the volumes UDID, oh, okay. not even the drives UDID, because, again, you don't know. They don't they have no way of knowing if the if the if the the whether or not the volume has changed and it's the volume that matters right before they start blowing away your data or sinking the wrong stuff to the cloud, etc. I think I think it's pretty good. But now with this three device limit, this is a problem because uh, it, it causes exactly this. Now, when I upgraded my uh, iMac this summer in the office. I cloned, but prior to cloning, I divested myself of my dependence upon running the Dropbox client on my Macs. And I did this with all of my Macs, so I am no longer running the Dropbox client app on any Macs whatsoever. And the, But I still need to remain synced to Dropbox. And the way that I do that is through Synology Drive. Synology Drive is their name for... Actually, it's a suite of tools, but the one of sort of the main the main leading one is their Dropbox like private cloud client. So I run the Synology Drive app on my Mac and it syncs with uh, my disk station wherever I am. It can do it locally if I'm on the same network as the disk station, of course, and then remotely if I'm not. In fact, John and I share a folder on Synology Drive and Mine, at least currently, is syncing because I'm locally because I'm local and John's is syncing remotely because he's not local. It all works very, very well. They've, they've had this tech for many years and it, they've really ironed out the kinks and they've really paid attention to what works well for Mac users. So so that part of this is solved. Now, Synology also has another piece of tech that runs on your disk station called Cloud Sync. And what Cloud Sync does is it logs into your cloud services, in this case, Dropbox, and it syncs itself with Dropbox. Now, there are two benefits to this. Number one, if you link the two things together, you have Cloud Sync syncing your disk station to Dropbox, and then you point a folder 
on your Mac at your disk station and sync that with Synology Drive, well, now you can sync any number of devices to that folder, which is a up-to-date synced clone of your Dropbox folder without dealing with Dropbox's limit. So that's that's one benefit. And the other benefit is that doesn't even act as one of your three devices because it's not Dropbox's client that's running. It's Synology's client that's running. So that may well change someday, but it is just treated as something that's logged in, not something that is a device, which means it leaves three devices open. I do the same thing on my iPhone and my iPad where I don't have them logged into Dropbox anymore. I just have them doing the same thing and I can use Synology Drive to access the, the synced data. But there is one iPad, the one that I use for all my theater stuff. Uh, I play drums and, and some like theater productions and, and actually not just theater productions, even in rock bands and stuff. Dropbox is often the shared resource that's used amongst everyone. And I find it mildly more convenient to have the Dropbox app installed on that device just in order to keep things. I, quite, frankly, it, I don't know that it even matters anymore with, with how well Synology drive is integrated into Apple's files app and everything. I, I could probably disable Dropbox and wouldn't even notice it, but there's a few apps that I use that have direct Dropbox integration in them for, for like, charts and scores and you know sheet music and things like that where having the dropbox app on the on the device makes you know makes life easy but it's great because that's the only device that dropbox sees as logged in so so if you have a disk station and any synology disk station can run uh, synology drive and cloud sync um, you're good to go so are you are you doing any like I, I know you have a disk station, John, and, and we also know that like there's the the many layers to the onion that, that is the disk station. And none of us are doing everything that a, any disk station could do, or at least I haven't met anybody that's doing everything. So I'm just curious, you know, at what at what level you're you're doing that stuff? Are you are you doing any cloud sync or anything like that? Um, Not with the Synology. OK. <clears throat> Um, let me see. I mean, I mean, I'm using their drive. So, so I'm sure. syncing, uh, the contents of one of mine using drive. So just a one way thing. Oh, um, interesting. So you're treating it more just a, as a backup. Yes. One, one way from your Mac to your disk station. Yeah. So my home folder, I, I push that to the Synology. Ooh, that's interesting. So. Uh. Now, do you push that to your Synology's drive, mm -hmm. main drive folder or to like a shared like because because that's so there's your main when you connect to Synology drive, you get one. There is one folder that's set up as your home folder on your Synology uh, just for drive. Mm -hmm. And by default, that's what syncs to any other device that you choose to log in and, and sync to Synology drive. So hmm. in that sense, I don't think you'd want that to be your home folder. I think you'd want to put your home if you want to sync your home folder somewhere. I, I would think you'd want to do that somewhere else so that when if and when you choose, say, to log your laptop in to Synology Drive, it doesn't start trying to sync your entire home folder down. It, it, it's akin to syncing your home for your whole home folder to, to Dropbox in, in its default hmm. configuration that uh, that that could be fraught with issues potential issues mm. it, you know yeah. what i mean like it's it i think the the intention obviously there's nothing there's no wrong way but the intention is for the synology drive folder the main one that's assigned to each account to be a subfolder of your max home folder similar to how dropbox is if that makes sense no oh. yeah 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 i guess you could do it that way well, that way you can you can share data amongst multiple machines without having, you know, you know, without having the issue of, say, syncing you like your preferences and your library folder and all of that extra stuff. Yeah. Well, I'm just doing it from one one machine. Right. 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 But but now you're limited and you can't do it from multiple machines. You could because you could create what, what Synology calls shared folders, which then can be mm -hmm. shared, you know, with 
uh, well, frankly, with anyone. And that's what we're doing with Mac Geek Cab stuff. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, interesting. Interesting. Very cool. Hey, uh, JP has, well, JP has something to share here. If, if our description hasn't, uh, hasn't shined the appropriate light, maybe JP's. Well. Fellers, JP from California, just reporting in that I am the uh, successful new owner of a Synology disk station that I have loaded with giant six terabyte wolf pack drives. <laughs> Wolfpack, I like it. And uh, I am replacing my Dropbox system with the server sync, whatever the heck it's called. Synology Drive. That uh, Synology offers. I thank you for the uh, years of talking about it. And after an exchange with Dave, uh, realizing it was a perfect replacement because Dropbox is pissing me off lately with their removing custom folder icons uh, and other things. So uh, I switched. A little wonky to get it going, but now I understand the system after looking at how it works and I'm trying to figure out where they're coming from and now I get it. So I have it on my laptop, my iMac, and I will probably get it on all my devices including the app for the phone. I figured it out. So far, so good. And it'll pay for itself uh, uh, within a year because I was paying big daddy bucks for the m m giant business terabyte drop box. I think I was paying like 400 or 500 a year. And uh, this thing will, you know, within a year and a half, the cost will... Uh, pay for what a one year of Dropbox would so uh, thank you very much I like that my files are not on someone else's server and uh, once I get another Synology in my uh, New England location I will uh, then feel like I have off-site redundancy uh, should something ever happen to one of my dwellings all right that's it Thank you again. Cut me off. Thanks, JP. You are welcome. I'm glad that that's working out for you, man. Yeah, it's, it's, yep. You know that we are Synology fans here and have, but we're not just fans. We are people that actually use them and love them. So it's good. And as JP pointed out, it turns out Dropbox uh, is now pulling uh, or cleansing your Dropbox folder of any custom icons that are in there. While Dropbox is running, it, it, they are still there, but it is filtering them, I guess is the right way to say it. it's not cleansing them. It's filtering them. And uh, and that is what led to him saying, wait, all right, I've had it with Dropbox. What's this? Tell me about this Synology thing again. <laughs> like that, it, And that that's kind of how this always starts for someone, for any of us, for us included here is like, OK, what's wh what problem can this solve for me? And for a lot of us, it's the the Dropbox problem, uh, either not enough storage or some feature or, you know, don't like your data somewhere else, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, once you get there, though, and I know JP will be digging into Plex and all of that other fun stuff, too, because it's all right there at your fingertips. It's pretty amazing. I got my dad set up with Plex this week and, uh, you know, just taught him how to log in and then sent him an invite to our, our library and he got his Roku TV set up on Plex. And he called, he, I said, you know, you, once you find it, he had to find the remote for his TV. So he couldn't find that while we were on the phone. And he's like, of course, as soon as I hang up the phone, the remote's right there. He's like, I just didn't see it. I was like, yeah, okay. And, but he called me like five minutes later after he got his TV set up and he's like, this is terrible. I can see every movie you have just by sitting on my couch. I don't even have to get up. And I'm like, yeah, that's the whole idea. So, it's pretty cool. All that stuff can kind of kind of just work, which is good. Uh, listener Joe has a anything, any thoughts on on this to share, John, before we move on to Joe's very related. But, you know, next question. No, I'm a I'm a big drive fan. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. Uh, Joe writes, he says, I'm looking for a solution for a client who has multiple offices and wants to be able to share files. 
I was thinking Synology Drive might be a good solution, but was wondering how it handles file locking, i.e. what happens when multiple users try to access the same file at the same time. He says, I also see on their website that they have their own suite of Synology Office apps to edit documents simultaneously in a web browser. He says, but my clients will want to continue using Microsoft Word and Excel for that. OK, yeah, no problem, Joe. Um, so Synology Drive certainly can be used to share files amongst a team. And we just talked about how John and I are actually doing that. In fact, we took the two minutes that it took this morning to make sure John was synced up the right way with my disk station. And actually, he already was. He just needed to point the folder and it was good to go. Um, Synology Drive, though, it, you know, there's nothing magic about it. And so if the app that you're running does not support multiple people editing the same file, which generally speaking is every app that's going to run on a desktop computer and and write directly to a file. Now, there are client server things like FileMaker or whatever, where that's a different case. But even there, you can't both point at the same FileMaker file on a server on a file server. You have to point to a FileMaker server uh, in order. Something has to be the, the thing managing the file and then putting the data in and out and being sort of the traffic cop, if you will. But Synology Drive is smart enough to notice when two people have edited a file uh, and it will create a second. It'll, it calls it a conflict copy uh, because it can't know how to merge data inside of any random type of file that you might choose to store there. So it just says, oh, hey, two people edited this before everyone had all the changes synced. So here are the two conflicts and it names the conflicts after, you know, it would name it like, you know, John's Mac mini. You know, it'd be like uh, episode 780 image, John's Mac mini. And and it, then when one would be, you know, episode 780 image, Dave's iMac office. And that way we would know, oh, OK, we both were editing the image for today's episode. All right. Let's, you know, now at least neither one of us lost work. Now we have to sort of decide how we have to fight it out and decide whose image wins, you know, that kind of thing. But uh, but at least we've got all the work. So that's how that works. Does that make sense? Am I making any sense at all today, John? Usually, yeah. Okay, that's good. I try, but I don't always succeed. Sometimes I get too deep down my own rat holes. So, all right. The question that always should end this kind of conversation, and and we will at least for now, um, be. Uh, oh well, actually, Kiwi Graham has a, has a good thing. So we will we will. We will address Kiwi Graham's concern before we get to the question that will will wrap up this conversation, which is uh, which disk station to get. And today we're going to focus on which two bay disk station to get just to kind of narrow that down, because that's tends to be where most people start. But Kiwi Graham in our chat room says, uh, Dave, make sure you differentiate between sync and network access. And Kiwi Graham is very smart about that because what sync is doing is just like with Dropbox, it is taking the contents of the files on a server over there and syncing them with your Mac and then, in theory, other people's Macs. Network access, where everyone is looking at the same file server at the same time, is different from that. And Synology allows you to do either or both. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing both simultaneously to the same file folder of data that could start to get really interesting uh but if you manage it right it would be fine but yeah and if you're the syncing is where two people could edit a file and not know the other is editing it on uh, a file server that's just direct network access where you're you're all on the same local network or even remote network and all just accessing a file on another computer as opposed to a file that's been synced to yours and that's the difference is are you writing to the file over there or are you writing to the file locally here and then something else is syncing it. But if you're writing to a file over there, someone else could be writing to that same file. And again, depending on the app that you're running, that may or may not work out OK. Uh, but that would work better than syncing locally if you're going to have multiple people editing the same files. So thank you for that, Kiwi Graham. Any 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 more thoughts on that one, John? No, it's uh, good that it handles. <clears throat> yeah it's got to handle situation. conflicts yeah yeah exactly yeah because we know some things don't like we keep warning people about photo libraries and itunes libraries and stuff like that right it gets squirrely 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yep. All right. And then to take us to Douglas, uh, he says, I have a one bay Synology DS116. And according to the Plex compatibility chart, this model does not support either software transcoding or hardware transcoding. However, all the media files I have on my disk station are standard video files playable by my Apple TV or Mac or iPhone. If they are all playable by the destination devices and wouldn't need any on the fly transcoding, will Plex still work? And then the big question, if I were upgrading, which would you recommend? So th for the first question, I think with Plex, I'm not sure if it will install on a disk station that's not built to do even some level of transcoding. But uh, if you can get it installed, then yes, it would work. And I've seen Synology's own video station do exactly what you're looking for. And video station is their own version of a Plex thing. It's not quite as full featured, but it's actually quite functional and it will let you uh, run it in a non transcoding thing. Transcoding means that you've got the video in one format and the device that you're playing it on needs or wants it in a different format, usually a smaller format or, you know, something that will take up less network bandwidth to stream to it if you're streaming remotely and that sort of thing. So that's why transcoding matters. Because the, the nice part is you could store your movies in a super high quality format, perhaps even lossless format on your on your disk station because you've got those big Mondo Wolfpack drives like JP. Uh, he was really talking about the Iron Wolf drives. But uh, but I like Wolfpack. So you got those Mondo Wolfpack drives. You just throw all your honking movie files out there. And then when you want to stream them say to yourself in a hotel room it's like well yeah my ipad could play that honking movie file or my mac could play it but the bandwidth isn't there to support getting that to me in a real-time capacity so better to have it transcoded by the disk station and sent or the, the server in this case the disk station and sent over and the same would be true if you wanted to put it on your iPad for like offline viewing on an airplane or something. You, you want it to be trans. Gen you might want it to be transcoded down so as not to take up more space than you need because you aren't going to really see the difference, you know, uh, on on that smaller screen. So, um, but I'm not sure if Plex will install on an incompatible device. Any thoughts on that, John? Before we get to hmm. recommendations, no, that's a good. That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, it's I worth trying. I have like a, a light version. Well, they, because, I mean, Plex uh, is free. Yeah. Yeah. But no, I, I know that the, um, the Synology, yeah, will typically not show you. Like, for example, on my older one, it doesn't even show me the virtual machine manager because it's it's too wimpy to handle that. So right. it doesn't even find it if I search for, well, I searched for it and it didn't show up. And I'm like, well, oh, that's weird. And then when you go to the page for the uh, for a lot of the packages, it'll say, oh, well, no, I only run on these. And mine was not one of them. Uh, yeah, exactly. Older. Yep. Yep. Cool. All right. So um, if I if for a new unit, there are three two bay disk stations that I would look at right now. The DS218 play. And I've got these in the show notes. In fact, I've even got a comparison chart ready to link to already in the show notes uh ds218 play the ds218 plus and the ds718 plus so the ds218 play is the least expensive but if you look at the chart you can see all three of these have a hardware transcoding engine i figure most people that are listening to this show will start with doing some you know synology drive style syncing like we've been talking about but probably very quickly get to a point where you want to do some sort of media management. And so having that engine to transcode your video uh, can, can really make a huge difference. And all three of these have it, but the DS 218s play D eight two eighteen plays engine is the weakest of the three. It won't do H.264 uh, video and it's got some limitations on maximum resolution and that sort of thing. But it's functional and it could get it get the job done. The biggest problem with that one 
is that it's limited to one gig of RAM and is not, at least not officially, upgradable. The other two have a more powerful hardware transcoding engine, which is good uh, because they will allow you to do full H.264 and H.265 and all of that stuff. And they come with two gigs of RAM upgradable to six. And that may, will make a huge difference in terms of what you can run on your disk station and how responsive it is. Uh, I, two gigs is sort of the bare minimum. I, I think that most of us would need. I tend to run mine with either six or eight uh, gigs of RAM. But but really, you know, two is enough. One is going to be stretching it anything less than one and it will be you will find it unresponsive or slow to respond i don't want to say unresponsive but slow to respond often so in 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 these scenarios and the difference between the 218 plus and the 17 718 is the processor it's a dual core versus a quad core uh they're both celerons so you're getting some decent cpu out of it without spending a fortune the d18 the ds218 plus is the generally the one I recommend for most people uh, and, and has worked out really well for, for a lot of folks. I see it on Amazon for the DS218 Plus for 290 bucks right now. So, and that's diskless. So, and the DS718 Plus is 399 right now for the extra CPU and maybe a couple other extra things too. But so I will, uh, I will link to that in the show notes too. Because uh, because I think that's a good place for a lot of people to start. Thoughts on that, John? Nice. Yeah. No, I think you made a. Yeah, I like that they have a, a tool that lets you. Because uh, yeah, I think you use their tool that lets you uh, put some side by side, so you can. Yes. See what's best for you. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's the only way. I it and I. I mean, I don't try to memorize these things it, anytime. I mean, you know, I kind of have my go tos. I have I've done I've answered the question enough that I, you know, have a working knowledge, but it changes all the time and they have a lot of different units. They are, you know, it's kind of like the Performa days with Apple where it's like, oh, yeah, too, too many options, guys. Let's narrow mm -hmm. it down a little bit. But, you know, yeah, it's good. All right. Uh John, you want to take us to Michael? Uh, yeah, let's uh, let's get Michael going here. Okay, Michael's got a good one, which is on page two. Why is it on page two? I don't know. That's how the PDF got made. Yeah, yeah, I noticed that when it turned out. It happens okay. all the time, actually. Yeah, it's. I don't know what it is. We print. We print our. Uh, we take your emails and and before we send our replies to you, we 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 save them. We use the print to PDF functionality. And then I built a little uh, uh, I guess it's an automator workflow. I don't even remember how I built it anymore, but that takes it and uh, you, gives you the ability to title it and puts it into Evernote, which is what we share our, our those those files with. And then also puts it on the clip, the title on the clipboard. So you can just paste it into our our agenda document. For some reason, printing an email to a PDF often but not always, an unsent email to a PDF often but not always uh, yields a blank first page. So that's just how it goes. It's crazy. That's how the sausage is made, folks. Anyway. Yeah. yeah so go. Michael says, um, I hope your end of summer is going well. It's still kind of summer here. But it is the end. We've got, what, a week yeah. left? A week and a half? Yeah. And here's the deal. When I send an email to my boss, mail on my Mac defaults to my boss's home email. This has caused her to notify me on more than one occasion to please use her work email address. She seems to have misplaced more than one email this way, which does not make me or her happy. How do I stop mail from auto-populating her home address and instead use her work email? Um, two ways you can do this. Um... I have a preference for the second, but the first one is, uh, so Apple actually addresses this issue in their help for uh, mail. And uh, one of the topics is avoid using the wrong email addresses in mail on Mac. Um, and basically what you do here is you identify um, in one of the preferences, you identify what are, what we'll call good email domains, you know, like apple.com or macobserver.com or, MacGeekab.com. Yeah, you could do you could do that. Um, I, I did. 
Yeah. I, I did that on one of my Macs a, a while back. I'm not sure why I did it, but it was messing around with it. And it's actually really nice. It will highlight in red any email addresses in your two CC or BCC fields that are not part of your preferred domains or, you know, whatever that is. It's it's just, you know, it's like, oh, yep, this is external for, you know, however you find it. And that can be super handy. So, yeah. Yeah. So you could put the good email domains in right. the list. And then if you enter an address and it doesn't match it, it'll be highlighted in red, which should catch your attention saying, hey, you're sending to the wrong address. But that could be a pain because I wish they had a way where you could reverse it. Rather than having to put all the good domains, you could just put bad domains, if you know what I'm saying. Well, you know, you could just put the domain in you don't want to send to. And it will look different. It highlights in red oh. anything that's not in that list. So you could just learn that red is good as opposed to red is bad, right? Red just means not on the list. So that could be, uh, you know, a white list versus a black list or a red list versus a, I guess it's a red list versus a black list, right? Or whatever gray, mm -hmm. charcoal gray list, because I think that's what colored males addresses are, is some almost black color. Anyway. Uh, so you could do that. Like there's nothing stopping you from that, from using that functionality slightly differently. But I think there's a better way, right, John? Oh, I'd like to think so. Oh, man. Get out here. Okay, here we go. So the second one, another article that they have. Is called delete email addresses in mail on Mac. Um, that's kind of misleading because you're not really deleting. Well, yeah, I guess you are. But um. Here's the deal. Mail tries to be smart and populate the to field with what it thinks you want based on past use. But it's not working in your case because I guess the addresses are too similar. So what you can do is remove what we'll call the bad addresses from the previous recipients list. And that's actually uh, in the window menu, I think, in mail. It is. You're right. And it's even searchable, which is even better because that can it can get a little bit out of control uh, to try and scroll through it. Yeah, no, I got, I got a ton of things in there. <laughs> um, so I'd say either one of those or both uh, should prevent you from doing this. And then pre-show, John, you were noting that there is another way to remove an address from the previous recipients list. And that's by it just in a mail message, highlighting the address and it can be an address you sent it to. Uh, it can, it, you know, and it doesn't matter if it's a two or a CC or a BCC or anything like that. Uh, or an address that, you know, someone sent an email to you, right? From, doesn't matter. Hi, if you float over the address, it'll highlight. And then you'll have that, uh, I call it the reverse Chevron or whatever, which is the little, uh, you know, thing on the right that points down to give you the indication that there's a menu you could click here. Well, click that. And then one of the options is if it's in your re re previous recipients list is remove from previous recipients list. So you don't even have to go to the window menu and open it up. You can just do it right there, which is kind of pretty cool. So, yeah, I like it. It's good, right? Yeah, I, I, don't get that. That doesn't show up for me. That's weird. Hmm. Why, really? why not? Huh? It's it. Well, is it possible that it has address, for some messages? I was going to say, is it possible that the addresses aren't in your previous recipients list and therefore there's nothing right. to remove? Right. Maybe. I don't know. All right. Good stuff. Where are we here? Where's the time? Time keeps on ticking into the future here, John. It's crazy. Uh, I do, though, want to take. A second, actually, a few, maybe 68 seconds, maybe more, and talk about our next sponsor, which is Linode at linode.com slash MGG. I'm going to cut right to the chase. If you need a server, you want to use Linode's all SSD based servers. Even their $5 a month server is SSD based. And here's where it gets even better go to linode.com slash MGG. And then use promo code MGG2019, you get a $20 credit to start using Linode. It, it's not like you have to pay anything to get that $20 credit. That's before you pay anything. And as I just mentioned, there's a $5 a month plan 
for what they call their nanode, which is their smallest server. So you get four months of that for free just because you're a listener to this show. And what's even cooler, if you like the command line like I do, and that's how you prefer to manage a server, you're good to go. If, however, you don't want to manage a server that way, Linode's also got you covered because they have all of these things in their cloud interface that allow you to pre they've pre built uh, they've come up with the scripts to build a server to do a lot of different things. You know, you want a VPN, you want to set up WordPress, you want to do like they've got tons of them. And if let's say you choose WordPress, you just choose it. It'll set up all the stuff you need and then it'll it'll ask you a couple of questions like what's your website's name and those sort of things that need to be put in the WordPress config file. And then it builds it and it says, OK, here's your login. Good to go. And you've never touched a command line, WordPress, everything it needs, the database, you know, PHP, MySQL, all that stuff. Good to go. So got to check it out. Linode.com slash MGG promo code MGG2019. Our thanks to Linode for sponsoring this episode. All right. Uh, Todd, John. Todd has a question that might seem questionable to many people, but, uh, but not to everyone. And that's sort of the beauty of this. He says, I'm wildly interested in archiving my old time machine backups. I have several old drives that have years and years of time machine backups from several older machines that I am aiming to consolidate the contents of these drives into a larger drive. I get it that some people don't care about their older backups, but I am dedicated to keeping these around. I've not used these drives in years, so backing them up going forward is not necessary uh, not necessary or a concern um, backing up to them going forward. Sorry, is not a concern. That makes more sense. I believe that due to the nature of how time machine creates backups with extensive use of hard links, that disk utility won't cut it and ultimately create a disk image many times larger than the actual time machine drive. I don't mind mucking around in terminal or even purchasing software that would do this archiving for me. In an ideal world, these drives would be turned into a disk image or something similar that I can mount if I want to look back into these archives, and then the physical drives could be destroyed. What are your thoughts? Um, I actually think a disk image, or or very specifically, you know, a, a type of disk image, a sparse bundle, uh, would work very well. And the reason I think this is locally, time when you connect a drive directly to your Mac and backup Time Machine to it, it will create its directory structure inside HFS plus and will use hard links to its desire to make it able to have, you know, full backups without having extra, extra data everywhere. That's great. And when you're backing up to a network drive, time machine creates a sparse bundle over there to do exactly the same thing, except all the hard links and everything live inside that sparse bundle. So I would think if you used Disk Utilities clone option and cloned your drive to a sparse bundle, you'd probably get exactly what you're looking for. That's my feeling on it. Thoughts, John? Um, I mean, I kind of do this. Well, yeah, I've told you, you know, I back up my backups here. You but, back up, um, but your backups are already sparse bundles, right? Yes. Right. So his. The, yeah. And once you well, yeah, once they're in the sparse bundle, but but that sort of supports the the theory here. Right. That if if you're able to move these sparse bundles around without any issue and you are, then if he just takes his backup and sort of pours it into a sparse bundle, it, I think that would work. I, I really think you're going to be OK with that. And I mm -hmm. think disk utility is probably your best tool to do it. You could use the terminal disk util. Um, command, but I think disk utility is even better. Well, I guess what I'm suggesting is that I use uh, hyper backup and it does versioning of uh, of all the files it backs up, including my time machine sparse bundles. So, right, right. So we got a Synology. You may want to consider that as a as well. A way to... I, I mean, I think there's like now there's an even better way, right? With um, <clears throat> if you've got a Synology and one that can run BTRFS. Then you can do snapshots of your backup volume, uh, mm. just like you can do snapshots on your Mac. And now you don't have to have backups of your backup stored somewhere else. Just do the snapshots uh -huh. and boom, they're good to go. That's what I started doing when we talked about it on the show here mm -hmm. a couple of months ago. It's awesome because because restoration is instant. I just say, oh, yeah, restore that to, you know, this snapshot from two days ago and boom, it's there. Done. So it's pretty awesome. 
Nice. Mm hmm. All right. Uh, what do we got here? We've got uh, we oh we've got time. That is I like that. That's good because we have a lot to go through. Wesson asks a question about uh, mesh networking and power line. Um, he says, oh, I need to figure out what he's looking at here. He sent us an Amazon link and um, it, it's not clickable in the way that I need it to be clickable. OK, got it. OK, uh, he says, I'm looking at the TP-Link Deco uh, unit that has power line and mesh Wi-Fi built in together. Uh he says it comes in a three unit bundle, but I think I'd only need two to cover my house. He says, I'd be curious about this. Have you tried it? And what's the throughput of the power line part of this? He says to where I'm moving, I can't pull Ethernet cable. How important would the power line be uh, as compared to just using the Wi-Fi backhaul of the Deco's units right there? Uh, the apartment's 1,500 square feet. Two units will be 30 feet apart with three walls in between. The aux unit will be connecting to AV equipment, TV, Apple TV, and DVD player uh, via Ethernet. Okay, great. And uh, and he says, also, do you know, if I go with the power line backhaul units, which TP-Link power line Ethernet adapters would be compatible? How can I easily tell which uh, power line units work together? The mesh units are rated AV 600 and there's a power line adapter, which is also AV 600. OK, so um, here's the thing. Power line is generally pretty slow. Uh, some folks have gotten lucky with it and been able to see somewhere real world throughput of, you know, three to four hundred megabits per second. If you've seen more than that out of power line, I would love to hear from you. Uh, feedback at MacGeekGab.com is good, as good a place as any. In fact, mm. perhaps even better. I, tr I try feedback at MacGeekGab.com. Well, that's option number two. And then if option, if those first two options don't work, try feedback at MacGeekGab.com. And with one of those three, you're guaranteed to get through. Uh, most of the time, though, with Powerline, you're not guaranteed to get too much through because generally it's going to do about 100 megabits per second. That seems to be what we've all found. And, 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 Sometimes less than that, 70. I've seen it range in, you know, any houses where I've tried it between about 70 megabits per second up to, you know, just shy of 200 in the best case scenario. I don't even know that I've ever seen get, it get three or 400. So um, I'm not sure that there are many use cases where these particular deco units with the power line built into them are going to be helpful. That said, I'm sure there are some uh, if you're, you're the scenario you describe with three walls, uh, but only about 30 feet apart. You're probably probably fine with the wireless backhaul where you're not fine is if those walls are, say, plaster, because plaster has to be stuck to a metal mesh and a metal mesh basically builds you a nice little maze of Faraday cages in your home. And f wires don't or wireless signals tend not to like to go through things like mesh and other Faraday cage like structures, lattices and things like that. If that's the case, you have to think about a couple of options. One option is, yes, to use this power line and accept whatever speed it gives you is better than what you could get otherwise. That's fine. Number two is use a different technology. Uh, power line takes the Ethernet signal and sends it across the power wires, which is nice because you probably have power wires in more rooms than you do have Ethernet. So that's why power line uh, certainly used to be really popular. Mocha is another solution that uses does sort of the same thing over your coaxial cables. And a lot of homes have coax in more rooms than they have Ethernet. In a lot of homes, Ethernet is in zero rooms. So uh, and Mocha with the right Mocha adapters, you get the bonded Mocha two adapters, which I think are the still the sort of state of the art Mocha that's available. Uh, I get eight to 900 megabits per second off of really old and crappy coax. So that could be one option for you and could be a really good option. But another option is your third deco unit because if you do wind up having plaster walls or anything in the way, you know, refrigerator, anything big and metal that might block signal uh, or water. I don't know what kind of tank. I guess you could have a water tank in your home. Uh, 
think about placement of that third deco unit, because if a straight line between, you know, unit one and unit two or base and remote one, maybe that's the right way to say it. If the, if the straight line between base and remote one doesn't get signal there, well, what about finding the, the, the two other sides of the triangle? Because if you can place the third unit somewhere where it can have a straight shot to both the base and remote one, well, then the mesh can be is smart enough to realize that and route the data that way. And that can sometimes help, too. So there's a couple of there's a, a lot of different ways to go. Chances are Powerline is the, the, the least best of those or the most worst. I don't know. But uh, but, you know, every home's different. It's impossible for us to sit here in our homes and say what's best in your home. But Mocha is probably best case scenario. If You know, in my in my opinion, Ethernet, number one. Mocha, number two, wireless, number three, power line, number four. Maybe that helps paint the picture. I'll put that in the show notes, too. I kind of like that. We might have to uh, might have to adopt this. Would you would you disagree? Would you what, what are your thoughts on that, John? I agree with your ordering because uh, it's roughly uh, in the order of speed. That's it. Yep. And speed and reliability. Water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. All right. Good, good. Power line. Great. Now it's in the show notes. Order of pref backhaul preference. There we go. It's right there. Live as we type. All right, cool. Um, any more thoughts on that one, John, before we move on? Nope. Okay. Jeff asks, where's Jeff's question? Uh, uh, Jeff is going to start us into the, I think we've got three or four geek challenges to, to share here. So Jeff starts us, uh, long time, big fan of the show here in New Zealand. Awesome. Sweet. Uh, he says, I'm wondering if you can offer some advice regarding the upcoming changes to Apple's reminders in iOS 13. I currently have an iPhone seven, an original iPad air and a 2009 iMac. Both the iMac and the iPad Air are running their maximum supported OSs, High Sierra and iOS 12.4.1. It is my understanding that there are significant changes coming to the Apple Reminders database format with iOS 13 and Catalina. So I'm concerned that I'm effectively unable to upgrade my iPhone beyond iOS 12 without breaking compatibility with my iPad and my Mac. Can you offer any clarification on this? So I, I haven't messed with this enough to know but i think that data simply will not sync once you've moved it you know to your ios 13 or catalina device that's it it will not sync with older devices uh, there were some issues in the beginning of the beta test where i think it was syncing and causing some data loss for people and so they they just nixed that. And I believe that's now how it's working. Um, I have some thoughts on a workaround, though, John. So but I'm, I'm curious. To, and, and this is definitely in the realm of Geek Challenge. So if you folks know anything, please, please, you know, we're 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 looking to, to kind of tap our hive mind here. But any thoughts, John? No, I, that, that's the one <laughs> I don't um, I don't use reminders. I don't know oh, why. fascinating. So the other solution I'm, that's kind of percolating into my head here is Apple's Reminders app is not the only way to interface with the cloud, the iCloud Reminders database. Um, you could use an app like BusyCal to manage your reminders. In fact, that's what I do. I store my reminders in the iCloud database, but I do not use any Apple client apps to interact with that data. And so I would think that if you can run BusyCal on either your old iOS devices or your old Mac devices, then you should be able to point that at iCloud and log it in. In order for BusyCal to log in, it you have to get an app-specific password because that's how iCloud works. It doesn't have any sort of OAuth-style authentication that is usable for outside of Apple apps, which is sort of bizarre. But um, but if you just go get an iCloud app specific password, and we'll put a link in the show notes about how to go get that. It's 
it costs you nothing. It's easy. It's just how it has to work. Uh, then I think that might solve your problem here. So we'll, we'll put that uh, in the show notes. So cool. And, uh, and Brian Monroe uh, oh, has a link to the best reminder apps for iPhone and iPad from iMore as well. So that's, yeah, it's great. Busy Cal, certainly not your only option. It is just the, the one that comes to mind because it's the one I use, but, but absolutely there are others that are, you know, more targeted just at reminders and that sort of thing. So yes, yes. Which is good. Yeah. Busy Cal, uh, it, it being asked in the chat room by Kiwi Graham, he has busy Cal definitely has its own interface to iCloud. It's not using on device data. That's a really good question because some of these third party reminder apps, just look at the data that's on your device and display it in a different format. BusyCal connects to your iCloud data separately from the iCloud syncing that's happening at the core of the OS on your phone. BusyCal connects using CalDAV, which is an industry standard protocol. Uh, it's a little wonky. I've done some work in CalDAV before and it's it's crazy, but the BusyCal folks seem to have really kind of mastered it. Uh, and they connect via CalDAV, which is why you need the app specific password because you're connecting directly to the iCloud servers and they take your iCloud data and translate it to CalDAV so that you can access it from anything. So yeah, that's, that would be the way to do this. I think that would be the safe way. So cool. CalDAV. Have you ever, have you ever worked with CalDAV, John? Uh, well, I'm sure it's on the back end of uh, yes. a lot of the calendars. No, I'm use. just wondering, like from a, a from an engineering perspective, did you ever find yourself having to deal with CalDAV in your in your programming days? No, you're lucky. Yep, there's there's like five people on the planet that truly understand CalDAV, <laughs> and most of them are now retired, including the guy Red Dutta who worked at Apple and invented it. Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, but the problem is it became so universal and it's like, and it's really wonky to deal with. There's no real good libraries to use to, you know, to like frameworks or APIs mm. to just tap into. So it's you kind of have to write your own or, or use some, you know, some existing thing that's, you know, janky and you got to modify it to all get it. It's crazy. I mean, come on. I mean, it's just times and dates. I mean, how hard could it be? I agree. I agree. And, yet, and people. Yeah. And yet. I have mm -hmm. found it to be a rat's nest. So there you go. Anyway. Yeah. I do get tickled when I get an invite from someone, usually via email for a calendar event, and it actually works. <laughs> oh, they work. All, I get them all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Or I see it. Yeah. I think it's an ICS file. I guess that's the, uh, the standard. That's the standard format is those ICS files. Yeah. Those tend to work pretty well. Yeah. All right. You want to take us to uh, Keith with the, the question he's got here, John? Yeah, good one. All right. With the announcement that Apple TV Plus is going to be included with various products, not the Apple Watch, unfortunately, um, I figure it's time to upgrade my current Apple TV to the 4K model, as that includes the free subscription. I've got quite a few apps installed on my current one. Do you know if there's a way to clone an Apple TV when upgrading so that the new one is set up exactly the way, same way as the old one? Almost like Migration Assistant, but for the Apple TV. I won't be buying until Apple TV Plus is launched on November 1st, but it'd be good to be prepared. <sighs> yep, good well, I think question. iTunes is out of the... Uh, so a lot of people use iTunes to clone their or, or to back up and clone their uh, iDevices. But I don't think iTunes is going to work in this case here. I'll tell you one thing that may, or at least it lists as an option here, is that Apple has something called uh, Apple Configurator 2. And when you fire it up, it says, hey, Apple Configurator supports iPhone, iPad, iPod, and Apple TV. So, and it's free. The price is right. Um, and it can do a backup and restore of your various devices, or so they say in the documentation. The bad news is that when you look at the description of what they back up, apps is not one of them. For their help, they say a backup includes information about the layout of the home screen, app data such as Safari bookmarks and calendar events, anything you can set in settings on the device certs, uh, account types, restrictions, and contacts. And then the next line, backups don't include apps or media. 
So I think it would migrate. I mean, I try migrating, you know, doing a backup and then a restore to the new one and see, see what that does for you. So but, um, according to what they say, they, they don't restore apps, but I don't think that's been Apple's model for, for quite a while. Right. Yeah. Apple, Apple, there is actually a solution to this. And uh, we've, we've been doing some digging while you've been sharing this, John and uh, Brian Monroe helped point us to something that Apple calls one home screen. And the idea is exactly like you might think the same home home screen on all your Apple TVs, regardless of whether they're on the same local network, they just have to all be logged into the same iCloud account. So you log into your Apple TV, you go to settings, you click on accounts, you click on iCloud, make sure you're signed in Uh if you're not already, and then click on one home screen and turn it on. And that will sync your home screen to the cloud. And now any other Apple TVs yeah. you log in will inherit that. And and now it's a synced home screen, complete with apps and anything else. As, again, as long as you're all on the same iCloud account. So and then iCloud will restore the apps. It's all it's all good. So this is a successful geek challenge. This is awesome. Yeah. Right? And that's been there since iOS 11. It turns out I had no idea. This is like, you know, I, I actively huh. learning one of my five new things. This is great. Yeah. Very good. One home screen. I like it. Sweet. All right. Geek challenges. We'll get these sorted out. We might have. So we, we actually might have solved Jeff's with third party reminder apps. Right. We've solved Keith's in real time as well. Wow. Let's see if uh, let's see how we do with the other two. So, Bob, one note is oh, yeah, one uh, one follow up. Uh, uh, I thought this may be an option, but uh, and I tried it, but it didn't look like it was. But iMazing also um, will talk to Apple TV ah. or so they claim when you start it up. And they break out and they break out the apps. But the thing is, when I try doing app related stuff, it's like, well, I'm going to restore the data, but not the app. It's right. Like, uh, okay. Okay. Because yeah. I guess they put restrictions in there. But um. Sure. All right. So this is the official Apple way to do it. Cool. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that seems pretty elegant. If assuming it works, which I assume. Yeah, I didn't even I didn't know it was there either, and I have the 4K. Yeah. <laughs> unit. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. Uh, I'm gonna set that up once we're done here. Same. I know. It's like just well that way, just in case something happens, if my Apple TV, you know, like decides to die or something wait a second can i remote into my apple tv no no i haven't found a way to do that (laughs) it should be doable but no all right um so the next geek challenge bob asks uh one of the 32-bit apps that i will miss when i do my transition to mac os pontiac catalina (laughs) is easy envelopes by ambrosia software He says uh, this works better for me than the contacts app because I can store multiple return addresses, multiple envelope sizes, and it prints USPS compatible barcodes. Of course, Ambrosia software is no longer. I have not been able to find a substitute. Yes, Hector is sad that Ambrosia is is no longer as well. But uh, but we safely got her tucked away here at TMO Towers East. Uh, Do you have any suggestions off the top of my head? No, I don't. Uh, I don't do a lot of envelope printing other than my own like FileMaker cooked up thing where I actually have a font that'll do the barcodes and all of that. It's actually kind of cool, but um, but no, I don't use a an a, an app to do it. So I don't know, John. Do you know of anything? Or are we are we tapping the community yet again? <sighs> Yeah, I used to use that program all the time. And yeah, I like the the fact that they did barcodes. I thought that some of the office suites have a mode that'll uh, do envelope addressing. Check check your word processor and see if they have a template. I seem to recall one. I, I haven't done, done it in a while that would actually uh, print out the postal barcode as well, which uh, helps speed your mail along. Yeah, yeah, in theory. I, I, I mean, they're, they've gotten so good at scanning and putting a barcode on your mail uh, on their own that I'm not convinced it matters anymore, but maybe it does. So, yeah. All right. Well, nobody in the chat room has that one. So we will go on to Kevin and see if uh, see where we get with with this one, too, because Kevin asks, he says, uh, 
I have a question related to Gmail and spam filtering that I've been unable to find an answer to. Lately, I've been receiving a fair amount of adult spam. Uh, and uh, he says, I haven't really done anything that I know of to cause this to happen. I'm sure I've just been harvested. Yes. And also, it doesn't matter. Uh, we, we, we are a judgment free zone here. At least we try to be. Gmail is filtering this into my spam folder properly 100% of the time. But because either they or Apple Mail occasionally mislabel other emails as spam, I do have to review what's in my spam folder before emptying it. Apple Mail is good enough to not display the images, thankfully, but some of the verbiage is so coarse, in my opinion, that I don't even want to see that. I'm actually with you, Kevin. I feel like after I go through my spam folder, I need to go take a shower. Uh, but he says, so what I'm looking for is a preferably server side way to have any emails that are, quote unquote, adult spam deleted, but other spam messages left there for my review. So, you, you OK, so he's looking for a layered spam filtering uh, solution. What you probably don't know is that your spam filtering is already layered, right? Because there's stuff that is so obviously spam and comes from servers that only send spam that many mailer uh, engines out there. Google's is certainly one of them. Just block them before they ever even make it to a filter that should decide, should it go to your inbox or your junk box, right? So so that's already happening and is one very, very good reason to, you know, to use a service that receives a lot of mail, right? Because they have the ability to sort of heuristically decide, yeah, okay, this is how that's going to go. As for something that could filter all the adult stuff out, I mean, you could create a set of filters on either on Gmail or in your Apple mail, but I would do them on, on Gmail to make it happen server side. So you're not, so it's not ever making it down to your Mac and not wasting your bandwidth. But um, I would create a set, a set of filters that includes all of the, the words and language that, that you know are the things that have this and, and Gmail is pretty good about it. You can say if it's in my spam folder and, or if is spam, I think is the, uh, the, 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 the verbiage that's used to, sort of trigger all this stuff but if is spam and contains you know this word or that word or this word or that word or, and, and just do a series of like nested ors in inside parentheses so that it like is spam and has one, one or more of these words just delete it entirely and you could definitely do that i'll, I'll put a link in the notes to gmail's uh i don't want to call it scripting filtering uh, language for lack of a better term, just to, um, just to, you know, get you there. But I, I like, I think that would work. I mean, it would require thinking about all these words that are disgusting you, um, at least one more time, but maybe it's only one more time and maybe that's worth it. I don't know. What do you think, John? Um, yeah, I find that Google, um, I, I look through my spam or junk folder every now and then because it, it Usually gets it right, but sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think we're still at the point where you do have to, uh, you know, before you trash your spam, uh, review it because something every now and then something legit gets in there. Yeah, but at least this way he wouldn't have to see all those emails that he doesn't want to have to see. Like if he's certain that if it contains this word and is already classified as spam, mm -hmm. it, like I'm good with losing that forever, you know, that kind of thing. That's actually not a bad idea that could make the process of filtering through spam easier. Although I will say what I do when I go through my spam is I, I do it on Apple mail and I sort my spam folder by subject. Because there are, I get so many duplicate spam emails that it makes it really easy to scroll through because I'll see, oh, there's 12 messages or whatever with that almost that exact same subject. And so it's like I can skip all of them simultaneously. And when they're all grouped together, it makes it really easy to find the ones that are standalone subject names. And those actually then just sort of stand out to me as the outliers. And that's where not always, sometimes those are spam too. And I let them go, but that's where I can look and say, Oh, wait, wait, wait. Ah, that's not supposed to be spam. So sorting by subject is my, is my secret trick there, but th that's not automated at all. Obviously it's just me looking at it. So yeah, so you could, you could try that. I don't know. Anything more on that, Mr. Braun? No. 
Okay. Cool. Coolio. Uh, we have some tips to share. The first thing I want to share, though, is because I've got this new engine that I'm using Zapier for. Zapier. Why did I say Zapier? You've got me saying Zapier. It's Zapier. Uh, that I'm using Zapier for. I can really easily make sure I have all of our recent uh, Mac Geekab Premium contributors ready to go. The list is just right here for me. And so I want to take a minute and thank those of you whose contributions came in since uh, we did the show with Bob on Tuesday. Uh, on the $25 biannual plan, thanks to David from Chicago, Domenico from Holbrook, Joe from Redondo Beach, and Mike from Tempe. And on the monthly $10 plan, Joe from El Dorado, Chris from Charliewood, Ari from Kensington, Michael from Mission Hills, Philip from Tucson, Bob from La Peche, Dave from Saugerties, and Timothy from Hendersonville. Thanks to all of you. And thanks to Paul P. for the one-time $20 payment, too. Thank you so much. You all rock. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And we've got some tips, John. Tips. Qu uh, one. One quick tip, one cool stuff found, but, you know, that's all we have time for. You want to take us to Mark? Um, <clears throat> or should I take us to Greg? Uh, no, no, we got Mark here. I'm just, uh, no, we just got a, a trail we got to follow here. Um, oh, he was having problems with his mail index. Um, and then he wouldn't be seeing recent emails show up when he tried to do a mail search. Um, well, I guess to wrap it up here, uh, he, he had to, uh, and he, he tried using different tools. Like I, I think he said he, he tried Onyx, um, but it wasn't, it, it, it wasn't able to cut it either. So it's weird. Yeah. I think it, it, he was saying it even, it, it would, yeah, it just said it, it, it couldn't do something. Um, so he had to roll up his sleeves and, uh, and do it manually. And uh, we have a link to an article that tells you how to do this. But um, I guess to summarize, you go to your home directory, library, mail, V2, or it's probably V3 now, uh, mail data, and delete any file that begins with envelope index. And that's what he did. And uh, you may want to make a copy of them just in case. Yeah. N never. Yeah. If you're going to do something like this, uh, deleting it may be a bit extreme, but removing it. You know, well, typically just put, them, put um, them in the trash. Right. And and then. Yeah. Just don't empty it. Just don't yeah. empty it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That in theory, that's what Onyx does. I thought it deleted them. I, I, I thought it didn't just empty them, but maybe Onyx does just empty those those files. Those three envelope index files are the what comprise the SQL light database that manages your mail index and and so there's the envelope index file then envelope index.shm which is shared memory and dot wal which i am told is write ahead log so but they are the three that comprise this database and if you delete them then mail just recreates them and sometimes that's the, the way to solve the problem is nuke it and let it repave and, and it repaves all by itself so sweet thanks mark for yeah. the for the reminder on that one that's good oh man how do we get here mine's v6 yeah oh. i was gonna say we're way beyond v2 yeah 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 so yeah it changes with every generally changes with every major os upgrade so i i haven't mm. looked in my catalina test machine yet but i we maybe we're on v7 so uh, one last thing is from listener greg who says uh, for cool stuff found, I'm a longtime user of Scanner Pro with my iPhone to scan uh, documents. But this new update to Prismo version five from Creaseed is awesome. It has more features and does a better job scanning. I also like the exporting options. I used to organize my scans in the Scanner Pro app, but now I just export the scans in iCloud into the Documents by Readle app. Ah, I still like Readle's other apps a lot, like Documents and PDF Expert, especially the latest update for PDF, PDF Expert. So sweet. Thanks, Greg. It's been a while since I've tried Prismo. I need to I, I remember very much liking that. And I think we probably even mentioned it as cool stuff found years and years ago. But um, I'll have to check that out because I wind up scanning pdfs or scanning documents with my phone all the time so that's pretty good yeah Any thoughts on that john um you know i'm gonna maybe toss out maybe a, a mini geek challenge it was related to one of the questions that we had and I, I saw that you actually posted a question to me um 
I don't think either of us have a Twain compatible scanner. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yep. Well, we had a, a question or commentary from someone uh, who, who was kind of going on or, or com- making a valid point in that, um, you know, a lot of scanners uh, tend to obsolete themselves when you upgrade the OS, especially the ones that have proprietary things. And my suggestion was, you know, try to get a standards compliant one, but uh, I don't have a standards compliant one. But I used I don't to do know this. That so, there so, is. Yeah. I, like, I don't know that that's a thing anymore. It used to be that there was this technology. I mean, I think it still exists called Twain, T-W-A-I-N, right? That that was sort of the 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 standard scanner tech. And if your scanner com- supported that, then it could be scanned to, from by any Twain compatible client. And my question is, what Twain compatible client exists for the Mac? It, AKA, well, it used to be, but I don't think it is anymore. But image capture, oddly enough. I think it might. Maybe it does still. I don't know. I mean, it sees a camera. So it sees a camera. So if you fire up image capture and you have your uh, camera connected, sure. like your phone, it'll see that as a as a input device because it is. Right. Uh, as is an image scanner. But um, but I don't have a Twain compatible yeah. image scanner. I used to back in the day. It was a really nice one. Super high res. I was using it for some document security work, and that's all I'll say. But um, but yeah, I don't know the state of Twain on the Mac anymore. I, I got mixed information uh, depending on where I go. Um, Adobe kind of suggests that there's support for it, but other people say, oh, it's been removed forever. So I don't know. So if anybody is using a, a Twain scanner with the latest Mac OS, let, let us know. Yeah, and um, if image capture is the only app that would support your Twain scanner, I would say definitely don't prioritize Twain because image capture is functional, but that's about it. Like you're not gonna you're not gonna make yourself happy using image capture to 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 do scans. It it'll work in a pinch, but I don't. I don't know. I think yeah. that's about it. Yeah. And one of the vendors actually gave that as a, the, the, you know, it's like, well, why do we offer a Twain thing? They're like, because there's a lot of stuff you can't do. And I, okay, I'll oh, buy that. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. 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 The Fujitsu, I, I found a post, post from the Fujitsu people basically saying that they're like, uh, we can't do what we do within the, the confines of Twain. So we don't support it. And uh, that kind of makes sense because it takes time and effort to write a Twain driver. Right. It well, but also Twain is is limited. I think is the issue. Or making it Twain, com- making something Twain compliant. Oh takes yeah, yeah, yeah. Time and effort, and uh, maybe you should spend that time doing 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 something else. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. All right, cool. Yeah, I'd be curious what what folks think. All right, well, that definitely brings us to the end. Now, this is the longest episode we've done in a while. That's okay, because it's what we do. It's no problem. Uh, let's see. What do we have? We've gotten through everything. We've told you how to contact us. I want to thank you for listening. Uh, you can call or text us at 224-888-GEEK. That's how, uh, that's how our friend JP sent his audio comment in. You could also, actually, he might have used the Mac Geek Cab app to do that. So go get the Mac Geek Cab app. It's free. Download it for your new iPhone and you're good to go. Thanks to four, three, three, five. Oh, that's right. I forgot. I skipped right over it. Thanks, John. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's awesome. <laughs> yes, the phone number is two two four eight 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 geek, which, as John pointed out, is four three three five. That is correct for the alphabetically challenged. Yes, alphanumerically. I don't know what is it. Alpha to no- that doesn't matter. Thanks to Cashfly for providing the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. Thanks to all of our sponsors. As we mentioned in the episode, we have uh, mintmobile.com slash MGG, linode.com slash MGG. Of course, in the podcast marketplace, smile at smilesoftware.com slash podcast. Otherworld Computing at maxsales.com. Barebones Software at barebones.com. Eero at eero.com slash MGG. And so many others. Go check it out. MacGeekup.com slash sponsors. Always good stuff there. We keep it up to date for you. Yeah. What do you think, John? Oh, I think there's another thing we're going to do for you. You all. And that is we're going to help you to not get caught. I got caught, John. I didn't have the music ready. <laughs> it wasn't there. 
wasn't there. You know what? We need extra help. Made up.